This is the CRE Weekly Digest by Lightbox, a data and technology firm for the commercial real estate market. I'm Martha Kocher with Manus Clancy, Head of Data Strategy, and Diane Crocker, Research Director. For the week of August 9th to the 16th, a raft of economic data released has taken the market from route to rally. Wholesale and consumer inflation showed more progress last month with consumer inflation dipping below 3% for the first time since 2021. Initial jobless claims were lighter than expected, and retail sales shot up 1% last month. The data calmed investor fears for now that a recession is coming, but man, as we've said that the road to recovery could be a bumpy one, and with a data-dependent Fed, we're seeing that with each data print. Wow, didn't this week show us the folly of making decisions based on one data point, right? Two weeks ago, we got that. And and by the way, it was a data point that is often revised and revised violently. Uh, Two weeks ago, we got that jobs number, which was disappointing. The market panicked. Treasury yields plummeted. Stocks plummeted as well. Calls came out for the Fed to announce an emergency 75 basis point rate cut. Panic was in the air. Since then, we seem to have gotten nothing but good news. That was my takeaway from the last couple of weeks that it almost underscores the just the folly. I guess that's the best word for just picking one data point, betting all of your hopes and dreams on that one data point. And if it pivots away from what you're expecting, just ra- racing for the exits. So in no particular order, the things that you saw this week, PPI set the market off in a great direction, lower than expectations, sent treasury yields sharply lower, gave market watchers the ammunition they needed to say that the Fed could be done with high interest rates that they could cut in September. Stocks took off. Uh, Then we saw a similarly, but not quite as benign CPI reading. So that made people feel pretty good. And then the really low jobless claims numbers yesterday. So all in all, what we saw was one bad unemployment print followed by three really optimistic numbers or really three very hopeful numbers, which point to the fact that we're either on a path towards a Goldilocks ending or at least a soft landing. And uh, I think it was a very good week for people and their 401ks and the level of optimism is really no uh, nothing bad to look at this week to say, wow, this is concerning. Man, it's one of the things that was carefully parsed, actually two now that I think of it, uh, were retail earnings, both from Home Depot and Walmart. And, you know, to the point you made, the sky is not falling, but there were some storm clouds that seem to be on the horizon with earnings commentary from both of those companies. Certainly were. The more concerning commentary came from Home Depot, which was pointing out that the consumer stopped shopping in July. They were pretty pointed in that commentary and that it seemed like the consumer was tapped out. Shares of Home Depot fell sharply after that commentary and it it led to some concern that the consumer was tapped out. And then a few days later, we got Walmart earnings, which were were, for the most part, extraordinarily positive. I think Walmart was up 8% yesterday. They talked about how their numbers continue to go up, particularly in the grocery store area. People seem to be trading down from higher end grocery stores to Walmart. Their grocery numbers were just through the roof. The one parenthetical in their commentary was inflationary of note, where they said certain things remain stubbornly high. And the two things that they pointed out were processed foods and soft drinks, which, right, that's got to be a big staple, right? For me, it is. When you walk into Walmart, right, it's where you pivot right to. You're not going to the the fresh food section. You're going to the the Oreos and the um, Dr. Pepper section, right? So they did point out that that's stubbornly high and not surprising, right? We, we've yet to see prices come down materially in many segments of the market. You know, that remains a concern for the, for the U.S. consumer. The thing that blew me away this week, whenever I look at Walmart numbers, you know, I I look up, down, what was up? Was it food? Was it clothing? Was it something else? But I never look at the raw numbers, but today I was. $170 billion in sales in one quarter, right? That's more than the GDP for probably 80% of the countries in the world. And they do that in one quarter. I mean, it is just a monster. You know, man, it's, it's interesting. Another thing that came out in the, the Walmart data this week is that their share of market is starting to increase at the higher income level threshold, which is a share from what we saw in the past. So that could be an interesting indicator from the economy that those in the higher income brackets are also out there looking for deals 
um, at places like Walmart, you know, where maybe in the past they would buy their avocados at, at Whole Foods and now they're realizing that they can get them cheaper at Walmart. I'm a convert, I got to say. My wife went to Walmart a week or two ago and she came back with salmon. Didn't see that coming. That was a real eye opener for me. I didn't even know that Walmart sold salmon. You know, we threw it on the grill and it was delicious. And, and I am a believer that you know, it, it used to be that five years ago, you could walk out of a grocery store with a $150 bill for your family for a week's worth of stuff. And now that bill is 225 So I'm not really surprised. I think that there's a lot of sticker shock for people. And it's not just people going from Whole Foods, you know, down to Walmart or Trader Joe's to Walmart. I think it's even the Piggly Wiggly or the Ingles, even those are probably losing market share to Walmart just for the 10 or 15 bucks that people can save on groceries every week. It's it's a glaring difference from five years ago. And everybody knows it, right? It's it's in the headlines every week. We we hear about how food prices are shockingly high. I think people look at their their bill when they exit the grocery store and it's sticker shock. And Diane, there were some other data points that CRE professionals were watching closely. Walk us through some of those. Thanks, Martha. Yeah, you know, one was confidence among U.S. home builders slipped for the fourth straight month to the lowest point of the year in August as high loan rates and home prices start weighing on, on companies and buyers alike. Um, there was an index of housing market conditions from the National Association of Home Builders and Wells Fargo that fell two points to 39 this month from its revised July level. Another metric was U.S. housing starts dropped 6.8% month on month in July. You know, I think as borrowing costs continue to decline, U.S. mortgage refinancing witnessed the largest increase since the early days of the pandemic. And the refi index surged 34.5% over the course of one week, according to the data from the Mortgage Bankers Association. So a lot of interesting metrics on that front. I look specifically at, at home building and, and home loan trends. Clearly, we're in a housing shortage. Getting a, a construction loan to build more houses is, is not easy, not just with rates being high, obviously, but um, construction costs are high and still rising. Construction labor is really, really tight. So it's going to be really challenging for a developer to go in to get a loan for, for home building. And I think that's, you know, partly impacting the Home Depot uh, do-it-yourself project numbers that we talked about earlier. You know, I think the rate cut's going to help a little bit uh, longer term. We're likely to see more home building, partly because of the housing shortage. Um, I also saw an interesting stat this week that we have more homes than ever before that have asking prices above the $1 million mark. So I read that and think there's definitely going to be a need for and demand for cheaper housing in the U.S. so that hopefully my kids don't move back home after college and they can find a house that they can afford. There you go. Two thoughts on that. Thought number one on the refi numbers. There's been a lot of pearl clutching about banks, their exposure to CRE, that banks are we're going to see a lot of bank failures. I, I'm not a believer of that. I think we'll see episodic bank failures in the next year. I don't think we're going to see this wave, but there is a contingent of people out there that think that CRE will really weigh on banks. The other side of the coin is banks make a lot of money when rates fall and their fees for refinancing mortgages, their origination fees can really add to their bottom line. And that's a, a positive sign for banks that may be able to pull a little bit of cover from origination fees to cover some weakness in CRE portfolios. That's a, a nice thing to see. On the housing start stuff, anecdotally, right, everybody's market is local, but I find it here in Western South Carolina, I get concerned by just how much stuff is going up so fast. And certainly there's been this wave of demographic tailwind, people moving from the upper Midwest and the Northeast down to the South for the uh, lower cost of living and the lower taxes. There's no doubt about that. But I do get concerned, at least down here, that the market is starting to get a little bit ahead of itself, that there's just so much inventory down here that uh, in some markets, we may be looking at oversupply. Um, it'll be interesting to watch these markets, the Sun Belt, uh, over the next year or two to see if that bears out. But it seems like a new planned community is popping up every six months down here. Turning to our Lightbox data dive, we released a report last week on the 2024 first half activity of planning and zoning reports. And looking at the activity of PZR reports, as they're called, can be a significant peek into what's happening with development, market demand, and investment opportunities. What did we see there, Diane? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, anybody who's involved in real estate deals, Martha, knows that getting a zoning report is, is kind of a cornerstone of the due diligence to make sure that the planned use isn't at odds with 
zoning regs, bit of an oversimplification of a, a complicated process. But what we wanted to do with this research was really see how much demand for zoning assessments had gone up year on year as we passed the mid-year point compared to where it was last year. So we just released a new blog, which shows that the volume of zoning assessment reports coming through our platform in the first half of 2024 was up by a robust 27% year on year. Of the total by asset class, multifamily projects were a solid 30% of the total, followed by warehouse projects in second. And and then lastly, when you look at uh, how the growth rates were changing year on year by asset class, we saw the highest growth in self-storage and hospitality and industrial. It kind of made me scratch my head a bit, you know, with self-storage, we saw demand for storage facilities spike during COVID because we all had to move stuff out of our houses into storage to make room to work from home. And then self-storage activity tapered a bit last year. So the spike we saw this year could be a bit of a, a readjustment. The other thing that surprised me was that retail experienced a small year-on-year -year decline. You know, we are seeing growing activity in that sector. We just talked about consumer spending, which is still, still strong. There's limited new supply there. So I think it'll be interesting to see if we start to see stronger zoning activity in retail in, uh, in coming quarters, especially as some old shopping centers like the Macy's stores that are closing, for example, get redeveloped into new uses. So you'll find this blog on the Lightbox Insights page at lightboxre.com. I do think that this uptick is, is not a blip. I think we'll see continued uptick in zoning. For the last five or six years, really the only redevelopment stories you would hear were the ones that you talked about, Diane, the um, mall being redeveloped. I, I think it was kind of hit or miss there. I think we saw some big successes, but we also saw some failed execution in that. And that may be the reason that you're not seeing people pile into that opportunity as much as they were before. The other big growth area in the past was certainly industrial and data center over the last five years, people trying to take raw land or misallocated assets, you know, maybe older warehouses and upgrade them into real modern logistics centers. But now what we're seeing, and I think I would guess that the up Take that you saw was a function of this is that now that people are trying to redevelop old office obsolete office into residential that you'll see this uptick be more sustainable and more widespread so i do think that this is just not a one-off that we're going to see more of this yeah i think you might be right okay it is time to go to developing and who is developing what are some of the stories we watched and notice that a bunch of the ones we're looking at were conversions yes i thought this was just an interesting week for the headlines that came through about who's trying or at least who's considering redeveloping assets around the country diane touched upon this on the residential part of the conversation when she said construction lending is tightest or hardest to get when it's new construction and and that's not just for residential, that's for commercial too. Whether it's ground up development or it's repositioning something, that is the most speculative type of asset you're, you're trying to borrow on. And that's where the rates are highest. And that's where your capital is most constrained, right? Fewer lenders out there allowing people to uh, tap their pool of capital for speculative projects, right? Whereas a refinancing of a stabilized property, maybe you're getting 30 bids, but for a construction loan, it's more lending by appointment, right? You have to go in and make your pitch and say, this is what we're trying to do and so forth. It's it's a little bit more complicated. And we saw several stories this week of people looking to pull things off. And I'll run through them, starting with the one that everybody was talking about. I thought this was just terrific. This story comes from Brian Paskis of Commercial Observer. After I talk about this one, I got to get Martha and Diane's reaction. RXR, which is the Reckler firm, Scott Reckler, is exploring whether or not to convert part of five times square into residential housing. So the property itself, 1.1 million square feet, 39 stories, uh, really in the heart of Times Square. And Reckler and SL Green are talking about converting that into residential. So I got to get your reaction, Martha and Diane. Would you ever picture 
picture yourself, you know, as a 20 something saying, man, I got to live in, I got to live in Times Square. I got to get out in that morning and, and meander around all those people trying to get my picture taken with Spider-Man or Elmo or the Statue of Liberty, you know, just grinding it out, waiting online for your bacon, egg and cheese in the morning with 75 tourists. Give me your, your thought on this. Well, I can tell you our office is in Times Square and there is a certain cachet to being in a place where you're looking at the ball that drops every new year and, you know, where there's a hubbub of activity, right? The boards uh, that are advertising in the last few years since the pandemic, obviously Times Square has had some other issues having to do with homelessness and storefronts that were closing and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's a vote of confidence for that area. And I do think that tourists love to go there. So good on them for for making that commitment uh, to that space, because I do think it's an area that people just love to go to. Diane. Agreed. You know, I think demographics will be a big part of it. You know, I think folks just starting out want to be in the in the heart of New York City. And that's what that's what Times Square is. I think, you know, for older renters, maybe not, maybe they'd rather be more on the the Upper West Side than in the in the busy Times Square, where, like you said, they have to see Elmo and Spider-Man every time they get out and walk around. But I, I agree with Martha. I think it's it's a nice endorsement of the area. It's it's a brave move. And I, I don't think they would have any trouble finding tenants for that space. Yeah, I, I think a lot of Times Square and Hudson Yards and, and, and where that goes, I think, depends on whether that area ever gets a casino, right? That's been in conversation for many, many years. And I think if time, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of getting a t- casino in Times Square by in, in any way. But I do think that if one were to go there, I, I think Times Square becomes a lot more like law. Las Vegas, and all of a sudden these apartments are worth a fortune there, right? That's where people want to come in and get their Airbnb and come in and bring their relatives in and so forth. So, uh, but good on them, like you said, Martha, for for trying this. Reckler, of course, a couple of weeks ago said that he was considering doing the same thing with the Helmsley building near Grand Central. So uh, a lot of thought about converting office into residential. So moving on to a couple of other stories, uh, very New York centric, but not just New York. The second story, Isabel Durso, she was reporting that G. GFP Real Estate and TPG Real Estate are planning a major office to residential conversion in the financial district. This is a 222 Broadway. The company's recently submitted applications calling for a 31-story, 800,000 square foot office to be turned into 800 apartments. Um, The cost of this I'm surprised at how low this is. According to the application, $44 million. I I believe this pair has done this before. They've done some conversions in New York, and this will be another one. Another story from Rich Bachman of The Real Deal. Isaac Shuva's Elad Group is looking to convert a Midtown South office into condos. Uh, That developer paid $72 million to buy 419 Park Avenue South. Uh, That's a 200,000 square foot office. And again, the Elad Group has had experience doing this before. They had converted the Plaza Hotel on West Street, uh, which had been a criminal court building in Tribeca uh, into residential in the past. So two stories there. Outside of New York, this comes from Urbanized LA, Stephen Sharp reporting this, that Cal State Long Beach is looking to take an office building in that area and turn it into student housing. That's another case of property conversion type. And in Arlington County, Rooney Properties has filed plans in that area to develop a 276-unit, 12-story property that is currently home to a Walgreens. So... What's my point with bringing up all these stories? And I have one more after this, but I'll get your your opinions here. To me, it's evidence that there are intrepid developers out there that nobody, not everybody is sitting on their hands waiting for rates to come down. And they wouldn't be contemplating these types of things unless they knew that capital was available. So two takeaways. One is that people are seeing opportunity, that the numbers pencil. And number two is that somebody out there will back them with cash. And it runs contrary to the narrative that CRE that we see all the time in the financial press is on the ropes. It also runs contrary to the thought that it's not feasible to convert an office building into multifamily because now you have all these all these projects that are getting off the planning table and actually going into fruition. And it makes me think that the busiest segment of commercial real estate 
in the next few years and maybe longer is with those who are helping with the redesign of of this repurposed space. Yeah, it's it. I, I think there'll be a lot more success here than we saw in the mall space. Martha and I did a, a podcast before Lightbox for years, and we had one co-host that said he would say periodically that the mall conversion was the dog that never hunts, and he was kind of right that every now and then you'd see a successful mall conversion, but more often than not, this conversion to a community college or a logistics space was the story that never took place. And I I think in this office conversion, we'll see a lot more success than we saw in the mall space. I do want to touch upon one more. We missed this one last week. Uh, We ran out of time, but I got to throw this one out there. This is Laura Waxman of the San Francisco Chronicle, a great reporter out in San Francisco for commercial real estate, um, does great primary reporting on what's happening there. And it's a market that needs great reporting. There's so much happening out there. You can barely keep up with it. Uh, Related out in California is upsizing its plans to build a boutique hotel and trophy office building in the financial district at 530 Sansome Street in San Francisco. Initially, this project was going to be 19 stories. Now they're talking about it being, if I'm not mistaken, 24 stories. So 575 feet with a luxury hotel on the first 11 stories and premium office on the top 24. So doing the math, that's 35 stories up from 19. Talk about a vote of confidence, Diane. Yeah. You know, what's interesting when I first read that story from you, Manis, is the same week that the Wall Street Journal posted that, my Lightbox colleague, Bob Dearborn, sent me a separate Wall Street Journal article by Neil Mehta that was about San Francisco sinking in bad hotel debt. You know, maybe you saw that one and they they referenced CMBS delinquencies that spiked to 42 percent in June versus six percent a year ago. Um, the two largest hotels have lost a combined one billion dollars in value. You know, so, yeah, in that context, the, the plans by related seem pretty bullish. And it reminded me of that quote, and I'll I'll mess it up, but you mentioned it a few pods back, you know, about those who rush in when others are rushing out. That was my knee-jerk reaction to your story. If they pull this off, good for them. You know, San Francisco is a city that's been on the ropes in many ways. Property values, defaults, quality of life, cost of living, exodus of businesses. You know, I will be rooting for related with all my might. And in another vote of confidence on the development segment, we saw developer Skanska had pre-leased 82% of its office space in Bellevue, Washington. It was an interesting story, Diane, counter to what's happening in some other locations. Yeah, I thought so too. This was one that was in commercial search by uh, Caillou D. Tuganescu, and it was about a new class A office building called the 8. It's in Bellevue, Washington. It's still under construction, and they inked a new lease agreement this week with, I believe, an advertising tech firm and another lease earlier this year from the Pokemon company. So with those two lessees, the office tower is now 82% pre-leased even before construction is, is finished. And you know, it's interesting, Bellevue's central business district has a vacancy rate right now of 21%, which is much lower than a lot of other metros right now. So it's an ex- it's yet another example, Manus, you know, that there there's demand for class A office towers. I think I saw this one's going to have a dog run. It's going to have a, you know, a coffee shop, of course, a, a gym and all those things that we've talked about in previous pods that really are attractive to today's tenants. Kansas has some nice stories in the last couple of years. They've done this a couple of times, putting up ground up construction, high end, pulling off some really nice execution there. What makes this story for me very interesting is that for the last two or three years, the Seattle MSA has seen a really high number of negative stories about firms downsizing. Amazon, Microsoft, Google, giving back millions and millions of square feet in those markets. So for Scanza to pull this off in the way that they are is positive. And to your point, apparently this occupancy number or this vacancy vacancy number in uh, Seattle, even with these big downsizings, hasn't really left the dent in the market that is left in places like San Francisco or Portland, Chicago, and others. So uh, it's a good story on many levels. And by the way, kudos for both of you for your pronunciation of some tricky names there, both the developer and the uh, writer for that story. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't have to do that. (laughs) Yeah, I definitely do better with Latin pronunciation than Scandinavian. 
Okay, let's shift into hotels, which we uh, don't cover every week. So we have a few stories we wanted to talk about. Yes, people know from the podcast that I, I tilt bullish, I tilt glass half full. And I've been talking about how transactions have been taking place uh, pretty red readily in this market. Uh, and that they've been ticking up every single month. And, and that's a good thing. It runs contrary, again, to the narrative that CRE is is dead. But it has felt like hotel has kind of been the laggard in commercial real estate transactions. We haven't seen nearly as much or as many as we've seen in the multifamily space and even office where we're seeing distressed assets um, sell very frequently. Uh, three stories this week in the hotel space, uh, each with, with sizable numbers. The big one comes from Hotel Investment Today, Rob Schneider, Aries management and Rita development are acquiring the 1600 key Hyatt Regency Orlando, buying that hotel from Hyatt Hotels. Purchase price just a little north of $1 billion, uh, $622,000 per key. The funding there, a CMBS loan, $620 million floating rate. And I'm only pulling this in so that people could hear the kind of terms that somebody is getting in that market right now. Five-year maturity date loan with two one-year extension options, the financing rate, uh, SOFR plus 2.95%, LTV there 61%. Uh, two other stories very quickly. Nick Trombola, Commercial Observer. Dune Drifter, which is a new firm founded by Kramer Williams and Chris Harrison, paid $80 million, uh, 640K per key for the Pacific Edge Hotel. Um, that's the highest recorded hotel sale in California thus far, according to uh, Orange County Business Journal. Lastly, Julia Ekchikson of Commercial Observer reports that billionaire Larry Ellison paid $275 million for a hotel in Palm Beach. Uh, this is the Opalm Palm Beach Resort, uh, which has 310 rooms in Manalpan, two miles south of Palm Beach. So I guess uh, you guys got even with me with those pronunciations there. So three <laughs> nice hotel sales for this week. Okay, shifting to multifamily. Manis, you like a slight detour. I'm going to give you one right now. Last week, we talked about Fannie and Freddie and the changes that are requiring lenders to confirm borrower information. We got a listener that had some comments about that. You know, Diane mentioned last week that Fannie and Freddie were changing their standards uh, for what people have to do for submitting loan applications, Diane. Of course. And it was, you know, it was interesting because the news story said, look, anybody, any lenders who are involved on Fannie Freddie work have to verify or will have to when the rule takes effect, verify borrower's financial information, things like cash flows, things like rent rolls, and do a bit of due diligence on the assumptions behind the appraisals. The story that we referenced said that this would be the biggest change to Fannie and Freddie that we've seen in a long time. And so we hear from one of our listeners, and thank you for writing in, you know, to say, look, I'd, I'd be surprised if lenders weren't already doing this as common underwriting, you know, that old like trust book verify approach. So, you know, we look to Lightbox's procurement system for appraisals that's used by hundreds of banks um, across the country. I reached out to a few just to kind of see what their reactions were. And, and I'd say, you know, Manis and Martha, it seems like our, our listener might be right because the ones that I heard back from said, you know, yeah, they, they do typically look to see see if rent rolls and, and operating statements match up. And if they're reasonably similar, they move on. And if they don't, it might mean a red flag goes up. Other things I heard was they require tax returns and they look to see if those match up closely. And then last, another said that nearly every loan has some type of performance covenant, like a debt yield or a DSC test which the borrower is required to report and certify. So, you know, I think for most lenders, this Fannie Freddie rule maybe is no great shakes and maybe a warning, you know, that fraud is out there and to, or maybe not even fraud, but just be alert to borrowers who may be trying to overstate their rent rolls to qualify for that, that loan or, or refi. So more of like a beware, you know, kind of like changing your password to avoid hackers or, you know, don't operate heavy machinery after you take your medication. Well, I, my thoughts here are we have seen fraud headlines and Anytime that happens, that's embarrassing to the entities that are involved. So I, I think that that's part of the motivation here. But I do think that we're talking about two different markets here. I think for the people that you were talking to, Diane, and for the listener that came in that I, I've gone back with for many years, and thank you, like you said, for, for writing in, that if you've been in this business for a long time, you have tried and trusted methods. You know what you're doing. You've been through many cycles. You know what to look for. You know where the red 
flags are. My guess is that this is a response to the fact that over the last five years, we've seen two things. We've seen the incredibly rapid rise of the non-bank lender, right? Private equity funds that don't have this tried and true experience. They haven't been through down cycles before. And you've seen an incredible rise in newbies developing, people that don't have track records, syndicators coming in with big partners of, you know, limited partner networks that are coming in that have never done this before. And that's probably a recipe for not having the same tried and trusted methods that other lenders have had over the last decade. So I think it's a tale of two types there. And for the people that have been doing this a long time, this is a non-event. So running through some of the other multifamily stories, Manus, we've got several that you wanted to highlight. Yes, I won't uh, bore people with my whole litany of of things, but I will run through a couple. Uh, first one from Real Estate Business Online, Equity Residential, which bought the big billion dollar portfolio last week, this week bought an apartment in Atlanta for $126 million. This is the Iris 04W, which is a newly built apartment in the old Fourth Ward neighborhood. The sellers there were Trammell Crow and Diamond Realty. Sale price 400K per unit. From the commercial observers, Greg Cornfield, uh, Sequoia Equities sold Paragon at Old Town in Monrovia, California to SCS Development for 87 million 540K per key. Uh, from BizNow, Cortland paid 104 million for a 300 unit apartment in Arlington. This is Park at Pentagon Row. The metric there, 350K per unit. This is a 13% discount to the 2019 sales price. So those are three multifamily properties. I could have thrown a few more in there. Sales continue to take place and that's a positive sign. And I know we had an office story that was one worthy of noting, and it takes us to Portland. Yes. You know, I, I hate to come up with a new thing, right? Over the years, I've had many different phrases, glass half full, glass empty, green shoots, bright spots, right? We have our metaphors, which eventually become cliches. I don't know if I want to make this a, a new metaphor, but it feels like every week there's a womp wah for the office segment. So people that are selling offices may not want to hear that. So we may not, we may not let that one survive beyond this week, but the office womp wah of the the week came from that Portland market, and that was a really disappointing comp. This property is Montgomery Park. Um, it sold for $33 million, down from $255 million in 2019, an 87% drop in value. The buyers there, Menashe or Menashe, I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing that properly, Menashe Properties, uh, the story there from Oregon Live. And, you know, this is a common story we're seeing, particularly in markets that are uh, heavy in crime, poor quality of life, high cost of living, long commutes. So Portland, San Francisco, Chicago, another case of a property selling at a discount of more than 60%. In this case, um, almost 90% off. So good for Minaj for jumping in and seeing value here. Um, but a disappointing story for this uh, prior borrower, this property was taken out of foreclosure. So the uh, property owner gave up the ghost a couple months ago. And this was the um, denouement, if you will, on the uh, on the Montgomery Park property in Portland. Nice Did I say French that right? word, man. That's very good. Denouement. I love yes. that. There we um, go. Three syllable word from a one syllable guy. <laughs> you know, well, I don't know if you saw this interview this week, Manus, but it was with um, Bob Knackle, who we've talked about in previous podcasts. For our listeners who don't know him, he's he's a pretty legendary broker in the New York City area, and he's a great person to follow on social media, especially for his naked nuggets. But one of the things that he said in an interview that I saw this week was, Manus, he predicted that the New York City market is headed for the largest sell-off in history. He referenced the average turnover rate in Manhattan as 2.6% over the past 40 years. The highest turnover was in 2012 when investors were trying to beat the, the capital gains tax. So he's predicting that in Manhattan, the turnover compared to the 2.6 historical will reach 5% next year and again in 2026, which would set 
a new high water mark. So, you know, that was both um, for pent up demand to sell properties, um, as well as some of the stories that you're talking about, you know, where where people just have to cash in for various reasons. So, you know, it kind of struck me, Manis, that if we're selling, if we're heading into what uh, Bob calls the biggest sell-off in history, you could have a lot more headlines to cover in the coming months and even years. Yes, he and I were trading LinkedIn's a, a week or two ago, and even more so than the five and five for the next two years, the one that caught my attention is he thinks between 40 and 50% of New York offices will trade hands within five years. That's yeah. a staggering number. It'll put brokers to work, and he's he's one of the best. And Good for them. It's been a it's been a sloppy two years in trying to make a living in this market uh, selling property. So I, I hope it comes to pass, mm -hmm. and I hope it comes to pass at things which are not sixty percent off, right? Something yeah. smaller than that, right? And a question from a listener. I, I might even call him a longtime listener, Manis. Mordecai S. Uh, reached out to us, and he's created a CRE office market decision matrix. Manis, I know you're a little bit of a gambler, so you know what a blackjack strategy card is, right? I certainly do. Yeah. So for people who don't, it's got the dealer's up card on the top, player's hand on the vertical, the y-axis, and the chart tells you whether to hit, stay, double, split, or surrender. It's helpful for people who are trying to learn how to play blackjack and what the strategy is. Well, he's done the same thing for office, and he's got data points like interest rate, CPI, unemployment, vacancy, NDAs, and recommendations whether you, you should sell, hold, or double down. He's asking whether there could be data to back up a chart like this. I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> Certainly, there there is data out there. Um, it, it was an incredibly creative idea, and I, and I love it. We've talked about this with the Lightbox Activity Index, where we've said when things are selling hand over fist, and the activity index is twenty five or thirty or forty percent above historical norms, that's a a trigger for taking money off the table or for not at least putting new money to work. And when you're coming in at 20% or more below historical norms, that's when it's time to get greedy. This takes our, our index number and, and puts it on steroids. And as you said, there's an x-axis and a y-axis. And on the, the x-axis, it talks about U.S. level national indicators, high interest rates, low interest rates, high cap rates, low cap rates, vacancy rates, et cetera, um, across the U.S. And then down the y-axis, it's how do those things line up against things like local unemployment, local CPI. It's those local things that are probably more challenging to get, right? That um, getting those local cap rates, probably a little bit harder to get, but yes, the data is out there. We are, some of the data we have already, some of the data we're working on, uh, on new ways to pull out this information from the, the vast array of, of data sets that we have. But I love the idea. And thank you again, Mordecai, for writing in. I, I think it's kind of a no brainer for people to have these things. And you even see lines in there where it says it's double down, right? When you see certain conditions, like in, in Blackjack, when the dealer's showing a six, and you have an 11, that's when you double down. For people that don't know Blackjack, I won't get into the details, but uh, for anybody that's played before, you know what that means. It's it's time to double your money. And here he set up these parameters where if you see this condition A and B, it's time to really lean in. And I, and I love it. I don't know if he's going to share this with people or not, but kudos for both the science and the creativity with it all. <laughs> Well, that wraps up this week. Please join us every week as our Lightbox team shares CRE news and data in context. You can listen on any of your favorite podcast channels and send us your comments, your questions, or your blackjack strategy cards to us at podcast at lightboxre.com. Thank you for listening and have a great week. Let's go.